Hey guys, and welcome back this morning to class. Um, we're continuing our lesson. I called it Unit 8.2, but we're dealing with primarily electricity and magnetism. Uh, in this video, we're going to look at AC electricity. Uh, we're going to also, in this section, I should say better than video, because this will be about three videos. We're going to look at what's known as the power grid. And the power grid itself means we're going to be taking a look at how the electricity is produced coming all the way from the power plant to the very outlet your computer is plugged into at this time. So we're going kind of, when we talk about power plants, usually then what we think about are generators. And you need a generator. And a lot of people use the phrase uh, to make electricity. I hate saying the expression make electricity. Remember, electricity is a form of energy, and we don't create or destroy energy. So with a generator, all you're doing is converting mechanical energy into electrical energy. So something mechanically has to turn, or something along those lines, in order to actually, and the word is induction. Generators work by the use of inducing a flow of current. So... One of the things we talked about last time was this. So let's say you get a loop of wire. And if you remember, a loop is just known as a solenoid. And this loop, we'll say, has an area. And we would measure that in, like, meters square. So if it was a loop like this, you could get the area by doing power square. But now let's do this. Let's say there is a magnetic field in the loop. Now, you're not going to understand what these X's represent unless you watch my video on what's known as the right-hand rule. What those X's represent are essentially the tail of an arrow. If you've ever thought about like a bow and arrow, on one end, you, if you were looking at, there'd be a point. And on the other end, if it was moving away from you, you'd see like an X to represent the fletching. So this X represents arrows are going away from you, so we would say that this is a magnetic field going into the loop. Now, what that tells me, and again, if you watch the right-hand rule video, well, this is actually right-hand rule number two, but what it would tell us is that we have a current flowing in that direction. Well, not necessarily a current, because something has to be true. So, we talked about this word flux last time. And right now, in this video, there is a flux in this problem. You've got a magnetic field present within a loop. So if you remember all flux, magnetic flux, da -da, magnetic flux is equal to B times A. And if you want to get nitpicky, you can throw a little cosine theta in there, but we're not solving any problems at this time. But the tricky part about that theta is it's not the angle from the plane of the wire but that's actually like the angle from the normal. So say, for example, you're working a problem that had any math with it, and it gave you a magnetic field, and it gave you a magnetic field, let's just say, that was at an angle to your coil, and let's say it gave you this angle, let's say it was at 30 degrees. The angle you would actually plug into your formula would be the 60 degrees. So it's kind of interesting the way that works out. But yeah, that would be representing like this is your coil down here. But again, I've got other problems that deal with the actual solving mathematically. Now, let's go back to this little thing. So you notice I've got flux. I've got a magnetic field bound within this area of this loop. But if we go up, there is no light present. So if you remember, in order to actually... Make the light light up to actually, and look at what's going on. As I move it, the electrons within inside the wire are actually moving, and that's this current. So our potential is being induced by this, and you notice you actually have to be moving the magnet. And what's true is I'm changing the magnetic field because you got to think I am increasing as this magnet approaches. Ah, I feel like I'm doing old school AP questions. As this magnet approaches, I am increasing the strength of the magnetic field going into that loop. And so by increasing that strength of that field, I am thus moving the electrons, which is inducing my flow of current, and we're seeing this light bulb light up in the picture. But you notice that movement has got to take place. 
So in order to actually induce or to have induction, and this is usually like, instead of saying, we'll use like EMF, uh, some things are used just like that. And so it's still roughly the same thing as saying a potential, but we're creating that potential by induction, and that's where we use this EMF. And the thing is this, you'll see me write like a little delta if we were solving the problems. The flux has to be changing over some time in order to actually get this flow of electricity. So there is our basic equations for actually finding like a potential from a wire. So we kind of got this a little bit, this uh, concept of changing flux. And if you, uh, I don't know if we even talked about, but the unit for flux is actually what's known as a Weber. So we've actually got this unit known as a Weber for our use of flux. This unit known as a Weber. Ah, let's see if I can get my B. My little pen quit working there for a second. So the unit for flux is the Weber. And so if we have this change in flux over some period of time, that's when we can get our potential measured in volts. So how do a gen how does a generator work? Well, the simplicity of it is really all you need to create a generator. You need magnets and you need coils because you've literally got to be having, and I've got, again, I've got a little thing over here. Let's see if we can get this. Uh, here's a basic idea of a generator. I think we've looked at this already. You use some mechanical energy, and I love this little FET from the University of Colorado. Thank you, uh, Boulder, Colorado, for this little contribution that I'm getting to use today. And if you notice... As the water falls and it turns this paddle that's in the problem, we're able to see, and for some reason, my mouse is no longer working. I'm unable to grab. I may not be able to in this little sim. can grab the compass at least. Look at the compass inside the coil, and you can see the changing magnetic field inside the coil, and that changing field is what induces the electrons to move back and forth. By the way, what you're looking at is AC electricity because if you notice, the electrons aren't actually moving through the wire. The electrons are just vibrating back and forth inside the wire. Now, the reason why we don't notice our lights in our house flickering on and off like in this diagram, it's actually got to do with how fast our electricity is cycling. So in the case of like our house, the electricity is cycling at 60 hertz. So 60 times a second, the electrons in your wire are actually being vibrated back and forth, which means we don't observe something like this phenomenon of this light taking place up here. So there is the general idea, at least behind this concept of induction. And you can buy a little small generator for your house. They'll run anywhere from 200 watts for a little hand crank generator to 5,000 watts to, well, even 10 or 14,000 watts. Uh, here's a little generator like you might find at Harbor Freight, and it says 4,000 watts on the side as its power output. Now, the front of this is actually just a gasoline engine. The generator is just a small box with a shaft connected to the gasoline engine on the back part of that. And again, the generator is nothing but, well, it's just like this little diagram we were using. You've got to have coils and uh, some form of magnetic field. And so you have to use something to spin or rotate. Uh, either the, You either rotate or move the coils or you rotate or move the magnets. And that's how you induce this flow of electricity. Uh, over here to the side, this is actually what you would see inside like of a nuclear power plant. So a massive set of generators, but still the same thing. You've got coils and magnets, and something mechanically has to turn either the coils or the magnets inside there, and that's where you're going to actually get your uh, you're going to get your EMF or you're going to get your potential out of it. Uh, so for example, we said like this can produce four thousand. Power plants, little ones can produce anything from like 4,000 kilowatts up to like some of the nuclear reactors and bigger reactors. They can produce somewhere along the lines of like 600 megawatts or 600,000 kilowatts. So it can produce a lot. There's three main types of power plants, coal fire, nuclear, hydroelectric. But they all basically work on the same thing. You've got turbines in these generators, and you have to spin the turbine inside the generator to either rotate the coil or the magnet. 
And so like a hydroelectric, oh, that's pretty simple. You know, you just have a dam, and so you've got the water behind it, and as the water flows through by the power of gravity, you're able to rotate the turbine, kind of like in that little diagram we saw a second ago, and you produce your electricity. Nuclear and coal fire plants both work in a similar fashion. Both of them in a coal fire, they actually burn coal, and that uh, hot gas off that burning coal, they actually use that hot coal to actually boil water, and they use the steam to actually turn the turbine. Well, a nuclear power plant works in the same way. They actually use the heat from the nuclear reaction to create steam, and the steam then turns a turbine, which is what you see. Uh, the most noticeable thing when people think about nuclear power plants are there's large cooling towers that you see that could also look like a volcano apparently no better than i draw but anyway you see the large cooling tower outside and i've had people tell me oh is that the steam coming out of the cooling tower this is definitely looking like a volcano at this point here let's just go ahead and sell it oh volcano the lava okay so that's completely i've gone crazy but it is like seven in the morning but anyhow, that steam that you see is not the steam from the boiling water itself in the nuclear reactor. Uh, this is actually just steam coming off. What they use as far as its names, just like it says, it's literally to cool off the water so that they can recycle it in the reactor. This thing's literally like a gigantic radiator. So that boiled steam in the reactor, they actually save it and they recondense it in this cooling tower and they're able to reuse it again. Again, just like the radiator in your car. Uh, we'll talk for a few more minutes. I'm not trying to make too long a video this morning. But let's do this. Before we get out of here, let's talk about like a generator and electric motor. Because the thing is, they are both built almost the same. There's very little difference in the construction to build a motor, and this is the basic diagram of a motor that we see down here. And look at what you got. You've got a loop of wire, and you've got a magnet. Well, if you remember, a generator has to have those same two things. But the difference is in the, what the foundation. A generator takes mechanical energy and transforms that into electrical energy. Well, with an electric motor, you're doing the exact, oh, I even said it in the notes, the opposite of a generator. You're taking the electrical energy and you're transforming that into mechanical energy or a usable form of energy. Uh, motors can be either AC or DC. The coolest word that I like talking about in terms of an electric motor is what's known as a commutator, mainly because I'm from the south and the word tater makes me giggle somewhere deep inside. But anyway, the commutator is actually this little part on the end. And you see it in my little design out here. Let's look at a real motor so you can see the commutator. The commutator is this part out on the end. And uh, how it actually works is it's split in the case of a DC motor. Because with a DC motor, what will happen is the electrons never change direction. And if the electrons never change direction, what happens is the magnetic field created by this loop never changes, which means this loop will literally flip and then stick in whatever place that it's in. So in order to actually make this loop of wire continue to rotate, in order to make this wire continually rotate, you have to reverse the flow of direction of the electricity. And that's what this commutator does. Every time, literally, have you ever seen the sparks coming from inside the motor? There are these things called brushes, is what we call them. These brushes literally are inside the motor, and those brushes literally, that's why you see these little black marks. It's where the, this commutator's been getting rubbed. That brush is where the voltage actually comes into this coil of wire. So you see the coils of wire here on the inside. Again, there's another picture over here, the commutator. You see these coils. The brushes pass the electricity into this, which, by the way, make a, make a usually you'll see like a little arcing going on inside the motor. Although now there are newer types of motors being designed that are actually brushless. And so if you're wondering what the advantage is, the brushless, well, over time, the brushes wear out. But they're actually a very cheap and easy thing to fix. Uh, AC motors actually don't require this uh, split ring commutator because in AC motor, you've already got a reversing of polarity due to the changing 
uh, field. Ah, oh, now this is cool. So if you, I was going to give you one last challenge before I get out of here today. Make an electric motor yourself. Now there is one catch. When you look at this picture, you may think, oh, I just need a piece of wire. This is actually what's known as magnet wire. Not that the wire itself is magnetic. But this wire has got a little coating over the wire. There's a coating over the wire, very thin coat, almost like varnish. Now, the thing is, to make this thing work, you actually have to, like on one side, one side of the wire can be solid. So you can actually strip all the coating off the wire on one side. But on the other side of the wire, you need to say, for example, like there's the wire, and let's say that this is the coating that wraps the wire. On one side of the wire, you need to literally remove half the coating. And if you're wondering, again, the reason why, this is your commutator effect. You need to have a break in the flow of electricity so that as the wire basically goes, because it's it'll start flipping. This is a neat little experiment. You'll have to take your finger and give this thing a little flip. Do, 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 do. Give it a flip to get it started going. But then it will exactly start flipping around and wee, wee, wee at that point. But anyway, you have to on one side of this remove like a little bit of the varnish and that gives you that split ring commutator effect so that the electricity... If you just have both sides, if you just strip the varnish off both sides, all that'll happen is the thing will flip once and then the magnetic field locks in place. Because if you remember the foundation behind this, let's see if I can slow this thing down. The foundation is what's got to be true. Let's see, show my magnetic field. Yeah. The magnetic field has to be changing in order to induce this flow of current. Now, and I can do things. What happens to the brightness? Uh, it gets brighter when I increase the area. So there's different little things in here. You can also, I should be able to like add more loops of wire. And if you notice instantly, I think I can add four, maybe just three with this app. But you get more light, you get more of a flow and more of a flow of current of electricity inside there. So anyway, all right, 17 minutes, that's way too much. I'll catch y'all later. Bye.